All right, kia ora koutou everyone. Um, I've just been sitting there trying to think about how our um, three really diverse talks might knit together and I think it's something to do with the social compact that we're part of as cultural organisations. So um, maybe hold that in mind because I'm about to get a little bit bleak, but I think it's positive in the end. So I recently returned from, I got a Winston Churchill Fellowship um, and got to spend three weeks going around seven cities in the United States visiting art museums, looking at, amongst other things, trends in digital development and digital engagement. And one really strong trend that I was looking at and that I learnt more about while I was over there was the collection and analysis of visitor data. And this isn't through surveys or through trailing visitors as they're walking through our um, organisations, but rather by inducing people to sign up either for traditional memberships, so when you uh, pay an annual fee so that you can get free entry to a paid entry museum, or a new breed of museum membership where you are trading your data for access and benefits. So the leading exponent of this latter new membership model is the Dallas Museum of Art, and under Director Maxwell Anderson, over the past three years, the DMA has removed entry charges for the museum and introduced a new Friends program. And when you sign up for the Friends program, you give over your contact details and your postcode. Um, in return, you are admitted to a program where, through various activities, you can gain points that can be traded for benefits. And so um, a very simple example is as you move through the different exhibitions, you can get a code at the door of each entryway. You enter that into the program. You gain enough points. You can redeem your parking. And in a city where the car is king, uh, free parking is a really, really strong inducement for involvement. Um, the more points you get, the better your access gets, um, and the more special you become to the museum. So with a body now of over 100,000 friends, the DMA is able to collect this information about which galleries people are visiting, which shows they're going to, which programs they're taking part of, uh, when they're visiting the gallery, where they come from. They use this postcode information to allow them to see where visitors are coming from. And then by comparing that information to census data, they can draw conclusions about what demographics their visitors may represent at scale. The DMA is currently using this information to understand which communities they are reaching and not reaching, which areas of their neighbourhoods they are underserving and overserving. Uh, the more time that is invested, the more of a data-driven organisation they can become, um, carrying out targeting programming, marketing and community outreach activities, and measuring whether that has a discernible effect on visitor behaviour. And this can be great because I think we are all guilty of relying on anecdotal information and our own perceptions of how diverse our audiences are and how successful our programmes might be. But I also think it gets a bit creepy because we trade our data for convenience and for discounts and for free things. Uh, every time we buy something on Amazon, every time we look at Facebook, uh, every time we hand over our email address in order to get ourselves a loyalty card that gives us a 10% discount when we go shopping for shoes, uh, we hand over our data, I think, quite merrily and without a great deal of thought about how that data is being stored, analysed and shared. So if we look at the DMA's privacy policy, it states, we sometimes provide informa personal information to other providers of goods and services so they may assist us in connection with ticket sales, event promotion, fundraising or otherwise, in connection with providing services or merchandise to you. Um, however, we require that those providers use personal information only for that purpose and we require that providers to provide assurances that they will, be, they will appropriately protect personal information entrusted to them. Um, a growing number of American museums are amping up their collection of data in order to increase um, engagement for the purposes of visitor acquisition, retention and conversion, and I am quite purposefully using commercial language to describe that behaviour. One museum I met with was planning to implement the DMA software platform with a free membership program with the same intent about understanding more about visitor demographics, but they also had a very clear plan for using this information under the rubric of personalisation, which is... I feel like has gone slightly into the kind of the uh, trough of disillusionment after several years on that kind of slope of excitement on the Gartner hype cycle, but it's still there. Um, so using this information for targeted marketing campaigns and to convert visitors into shoppers, shoppers into donors, uh, effectively using the data to maximise their revenue. So as well as giving us information to improve the relevance of our programs, to tackle inequality of access and to increase our revenue generation, data can sometimes also tell us things that we don't really want to hear. 
Um, Colleen Dillenschneider is a consultant with a company in the States that specialises, amongst other things, in the application of data analysis to the non-profit sector, and she writes and presents regularly on data as it relates to cultural and visitor organisations. And in one of her most recent blog posts, she crunched the data on free admission days, which are the days that um, museums in the States who have paid entry, they run, say, every, say a free Saturday, once a month, um, which is all about trying to encourage, encourage a more diverse audience. It's about trying to lower that barrier of entry and tempt people into um, walking in the doors of a place that they might not other walk, walk into. And uh, they use lots of uh, worthy language about this, but I think if we really break it down when we think about the audience that we're talking about, we're usually referring to someone younger, browner, and less educated than we are. Um, no one says it quite that frankly. Uh, the data shows, however, in America that free admission days do not attract underserved audiences, and rather that uh, first, admission price is not identified as the chief barrier of access. Second, that free access days attract higher earning and higher educated attendees than paid access days. Uh, thirdly, that free access days do not tempt non-visitors, but rather accelerate the speed at which existing visitors come back to your museum again. And fourthly, that cultural organisations generally don't know how to or how to effectively market these days to underserved audiences, because instead they're using their existing email databases, social media platforms, and their regular marketing outlets, which means they're putting out the message to the people who they already talk to. And these are really unsettling things for really well-meaning people like all of us to hear. Uh, Dylan Schneider's company generates these insights by buying data from many sources, uh, our data, the data that people like us generate. Uh, they then analyse this data and sell that analysis and consultancy services back into the cultural organisations, cultural organisations just like ours. And I should note that Dylan Schneider is not at all, all covert about this, and in fact, uh, her company has been incredibly generous in allowing her to share this research with us freely as a sector, rather than locking it all down. There's no escaping the fact, though, that companies are being built upon and money is being made on the back of a wave of data that we are all drip-feeding into. And the concern about the collection, security and use of data from the outing of philanderers on data sites through to a former CIA director's statement, we kill people based on metadata. These are hardly new concerns. And as I was preparing for this talk, um, a number of presentations and articles kind of floated across my radar, and they shared a common theme where they compared, the comparison, they compared uh, data technology to the history of nuclear technology. So, writing for The Guardian in 2008, Cory Doctorow said, we should treat personal electronic data with the same care and respect as weapons grade plutonium. It is dangerous, long lasting, and once it is leaked, there's no getting it back. Doctorow went on at that time um, to propose that data should be embargoed for 200 years, that anyone who touches or cares for that data over that period should be properly trained, and that businesses and governments must be made to bear the costs associated with responsible data care. Um, at the start of October this year, Pinboard founder Marce Siglowski, uh, he spoke at O'Reilly Media's Big Data Conference, and he was really purposefully trying to prick the bu bubble of big data enthusiasts. Um, he painted a purposefully grim picture of data as, in his words, not a pristine resource, but a waste product, a bunch of radioactive toxic sludge that we don't know how to handle. He drew an explicit link between data technology and nuclear technology as two powerful innovations whose, in his words, beneficial uses we could never quite untangle from the harmful ones. And like Dr. O, Siglowski describes a similarity between data and nuclear waste, a material that has the potential to last far longer than the institutions that have been built to manage it. And he stated, information about people retains its power as long as those people are alive and sometimes as long as their children are alive. No one knows what will become of sites like Twitter in five or 10 years, but the data those sites own will retain the power to hurt for decades. He also noted that data technology is creating a situation where people are reacting to the manipulations of big data, where we're purposefully gaming the systems that we encounter, forcing an ever-evolving arms race between data collectors and data creators that creates more distance between us as humans, not more understanding. And finally, just um, a couple of weeks ago, James Bridle, who is a, a British artist and activist and web thinker, wrote an essay that uh, name-checked these two above pieces that I've just talked about. Uh, he's written and made work extensively about mass surveillance, and in this piece he draws a parallel 
between the Cold War that nuclear technology locked the Western world into for 45 years and the situation that we might be finding ourselves in with big data today. And observe that uh, even though the information that we're collecting about human behaviour is growing and growing and growing, at a, at a pace we can't even begin to comprehend, our sympathy and empathy and connection across political spectrums, across race, across religion, across the boundaries between nations is not growing at the same speed. And in fact, we are possibly becoming more and more literate, more and more online, and more and more distanced from each other. Um, and so I do have a point uh, after all of that. And I think it's that we in cultural organisations tend to always think of ourselves as the white hats and as the good guys. Um, and I want to call out to libraries here because the, the National Library is my, my home ground. This is where I had my formative kind of growing up experience as a, as a professional. And what I really admire about libraries is this incredibly strong ethos of free and private access to information. And I know that is something that libraries around the world defend to the death. But the siren call of data is strong, and we will all soon, if we have not already, have to ask ourselves who's going to benefit from the data that we collect and how we keep each other safe. Thank you.